And this time, Baba James Small, please come on up, Baba James Small. Thank you so much. Culture, moving forward to culture. Hotel. Thank you, Sister Lewis, for your report. And um, I want to see you, Doug, before I leave, because um, in about a month, Dr. Jeffries and I, and our partners, will be closing on a hotel in Ghana. And, all the advice and assistance, assistance and guidance in terms of advice is um, because we, we will be going over in a couple of weeks to register our corporation. And the name is very close, you know, the African American Trade and International Investment Corp Group. So um, we'll talk. Um, I'm going to make this quick because Dr. J and I have got a plane to take within two hours. Uh, the Cultural Committee and I uh, can't press this hard enough. And you know, it's difficult. I'm standing in a religious institution, and there's no way you're going to handle cultural transformation back to African healthy, optimal consciousness without washing the brain of a lot of this religious garbage that the West have been using to your consciousness. And let me be very clear I don't think any of the major Western religions are African, and I think there are little things you can do for them to help ourselves, and I think we've done them, but our conditions bespeak the fact of the failures of those institutions. Culture, first and foremost, should protect a people from genocide. This is one of the six points we raised. I will give you a complete report in two weeks once we pull all of the notes together. But the most, the, the most significant point about culture, culture is what protects a people from genocide. Secondly, culture is the instrument involved in the intergenerational transmission of the wisdom of a people to the next generation. Whether you use music, whether you use film, whether you use Whatever technology you use in communication and transmission, it should be used to transmit the wisdom of your ancestors to the next generation. Culture has been and is for all people except us the primary education system. When other people walk into schools, the way they're educated has to do with what their culture have decided is the best approach for that mind's formulation. When we walk into schools, our mind is formulated by values, interests, and principles that were derived at by our enemies' peoples. Culture is how people form their worldview, meaning how we see and understand our immediate and our greater ecology, how it affects us and how we affect it. That culture informs a people of how to recreate themselves. Without culture, your culture, you cannot recreate yourself in a healthy manner in an alien environment. When Japanese people come to America, they can recreate themselves and their children because they bring with them a healthy Japanese culture. If you don't have a healthy African culture, you cannot recreate yourself in other places. And so those are the main points and what we will do in the greater report, which will come to this group in about two weeks. I've spoken with some others who've taken the detailed notes on the committee we will go over those notes, we will write it up. But I'm going to make a few more comments and then I'll sit down because we are running on a time thing with these airlines. At the center of a people's culture, and I think this was the last point, is their spiritual system. You can't have a belief in God that's derived from the experience of another human being. That's ridiculous. The world cannot have an experience about God that was derived from a rabbit. 
the squirrel would be presumed to be insane. It could run around conducting itself like a rabbit and you know it's a squirrel. The squirrel couldn't even plan for itself by storing its seeds during the year so that it can protect itself from hunger. Squirrel culture says to protect yourself from starvation, you must gather seeds during the year, you store it in a peculiar manner in trees, and to protect yourself from the hunters in your ecology, you learn to climb and jump in those trees. Now if you don't have that knowledge and went to come and you haven't stored it, you're going to die when a squirrel is outside of squirrel's culture. We don't like squirrels outside of squirrel's culture. So culture, when we think of culture protecting us from genocide, and then that piece, and it's hard for me to do it, because I know we all Christian, Muslims, and Hebrews who like to understand that. I'm sorry for y'all, but I do understand. Could you imagine you show you how damaging the thing can be. Could you imagine Jewish parents carting their children off to a, a Nazi formed school or a Nazi, Nazi philosophically run hospital for health care or education? You can't imagine that. You can't even imagine Jews labeling their children with names or their institution with names that the Nazis have made famous. You wouldn't even think of that. You would think it's inappropriate. Yet we do it every day. We do it every day and think absolutely nothing of it. When we walk into a religious institution, there's a man, and I thought he might be here. Well, I'm going to be with him in a couple of weeks in New York at a conference on indigenous uh, spiritual system, African indigenous spiritual system. That's Brother Fukia. He said, yeah. at a conference a few weeks ago, he told us that we were a seed of a seed of the seed within a seed of a seed of the seed. In short, he was saying we were God having this experience. That scares y'all. Y'all scared death to be God having this experience. Y'all want to be anything but. But I don't know anyone who could stand with me in my face and talk about African culture and show me an African culture that doesn't speak very clearly that the human beings are actually the deity itself having this experience. That's what all of our culture is about. And then the struggle around meaning the tools of the culture, the metaphor, the allegory, the, the, the concepts, principles, and ideas, um, the structure of family, the structure of relationship male and female, the structure of relationship male and male and female and, and, and female, the structure of relationship of uh, parents and children, the structure of relationship um, between one human community and another is all defined because of our understanding of the essence of the nature of what we call God. That's how we derive culture in Africa. And that is precisely why the African, I'm not talking about the Africans of the day with all the folks running around God in Nigeria being Muslims and Christians and causing all this havoc, praying all day and praying all Sunday and coming out practicing genocide on Monday. We do it right here in America. We practice mental genocide, physical genocide, social genocide, yeah. culture genocide. When ourselves, our children, our mates, every day, because of our ignorance of what culture should inform and instruct our behaviors. And so I don't applaud. I wish applause would just stop. Let's do a silent listening. <laughs> applaud kind of shakes you off the course. Applaud when it's all over. Just silent listening. Please hear what I'm saying. I think I outlined in the group, if you were in the Yoruba tradition, and even those in the Yoruba tradition, I'm knocking them too. They play them too. Yoruba has been structured on this side for the most part, just like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Many of the archons, except for a few communities, and I won't get them in trouble by calling their names, they're over here practicing the tradition just like they are doing, in the same motif and cultural presentation as the enemy's methodology, so it's not working. I'm a priest in the Yoruba tradition, I'm a priest of Ashun, you know, 
I've studied and I'm, 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 I'm devoted to Oya. I'm a priest of also Shango. What does that mean? It means I have a knowledge, a bodies of knowledge, of how to structure the human character and the group character using principles, concepts, and ideas that our ancestors prove to be valid in its implementation. Quick example. Say someone says, we tell the story of Shelby. I went to this play. Damn, I do like this. They had this play in New York about Oya. And it was a beautiful play, well written, well done. But they betrayed Oya as this woman who was this flirty, whoring, um, polyandric. And first, and it was written by someone who was high in the tradition. And it tells me you have no understanding what the tradition is about. There was never a woman named Oya. There was never a man named Shango. There was never a man named Ogun. Those are symbols, anthropomorphic. See that picture up there? That's an anthropomorphic representation of a concept. That's all it is. Now, if we don't understand that. We want to know how to use the virgin to transform ourselves into the virgin consciousness. So when you think of a Shango, you think of a king. Shango is the king, the Alapian power and authority who is the guardian of the principles, standards, ethics, and morals of a community who should live it with exemplary as the model and the role model and example for the community. But in the case of Shanga and the metaphor, he violates all of these rules. And so what occurs is when wisdom through um, um, the wisdom Orisha comes to him, he realizes he has violated the fundamental principles of his office. So he commits suicide. But before he could die, he's saved by Oya, the woman who can transform herself into a deer or into a woman. But what does that mean? It means she is the concept of change in process. Shango, in the realization that I've committed a crime, I've violated the law, I've, I've broken the principle, suddenly realizes and has the courage to change himself. Even killing himself is changing himself from continuing to bruise, abuse the principles. So that courage and realization to change yourself a better, higher spiritual being, that quickening is Shango. That's the lightning moment. Oya, his wife, is changed in process which follows the realization for the need for change. But she also marries Ogun. And people say, oh, she was into polyandry. But that's cool. We could use polyandry to explain it. But that's a metaphor. Ogun is the god of iron, and they said the god of war. But most of the implements in war that's used is iron. And iron or the steel is made from some rocks in the ground. But what do you do with the rock? You throw it in the fire and you burn out its impurities to derive at that steel that you're going to use as a tool or weapon. What does that concept represent? Transformation. Transformation comes as a result of what? Marrying or your change. So if we're going to study our culture, we got to move past the surface understanding of principles, concepts, and ideas that should reform and transform human character and human personality the way the West approaches religion. And we have to study and go back to the way our ancestors approach teaching culture using religion. Remember the word religion, and even in English, re, Latin, to do over again, or to go back, ligio, to bind. So all religion really means is that this is a tool to bind you back to principal concepts and ideas which should be binding back to God itself at the very instant of the beginning. And so if the instrument isn't doing that, the instrument isn't efficient for the job. And so culture is so important because that your particular peculiar culture a notion of how you do that binding back is at the very center of that culture. And you can't be afraid to access it. I don't care what you call it. Because I don't believe there's a religion called Europe, but that's a people. But we use that because that people do practice this, this notion. But if I took the Akan, they got what we call deities too, but they're powers. They're forces of nature. But every force that's in nature is in the human personality, is in the human character, or its potential is there. And so what the ancestors did, you go back as far as Kemet, they show you that it is the, 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 all those, those natures are forces of nature. 
And if we understand how they work in nature, we can understand how they work in us. And we can build a relationship with nature that's based on a harmonious balance and not about exploiting and destruction. And so our culture is important. And we got to get past just the periphery. Dancing is good. But if you're doing an African dance and you're doing body movements and you're doing step and you do know what, not why, if you don't know why they were designed, don't do them. Find out what was that peculiar dance designed for. You understand? Some dance are designed for medical reasons. Some dance are designed for entertainment reasons. Some dances are designed for spiritual reasons. Same thing with our music. So we need to study our culture. But the culture that worked in Nigeria or Ghana or Burkina Faso or Congo 2,000 years ago may be in need of modification to work within this ecological, both social, political, and economic ecology that we're in today. But you must first understand the principle that is foundation before you can innovate on it to suit your situation. And so we're going to really go over the culture thing and try to explain what we understand um, as African culture, raising those six points. But I just want you to know culture isn't just dance, music, and so forth. And then the final thing with culture is language. Because you see, language transmit the thought structure that interprets and explains culture. So if you use somebody else's language like we're forced to do, we can't do it very well. And that's why Geechee people, well, they, they laugh at us, because I'm from South Carolina, like most of you Geechee folks, or children of Geechee folks. And you know, like we says, um, I ain't going to do that because I forgot to get you time too. You know oh, you ain't have to do that know-how anyway. But see, we understood English wasn't sufficient to express what we meant when we say, don't do that. <laughs> so we say, you ain't have to do that know-how anyway. We've given you four different levels of tonation using English on why you better not do that. <laughs> now they say we were speaking bad English. No, we weren't. We were speaking this language using the Germanic, Latin, the English uh, vocabulary, but we were using an African grammar structure to express ourselves. And so we got to get back to our culture so that the culture informs and instructs our politics and our economics so that we can build healthy economics and political systems that operate into the interests of this organism we call an Africa. So we will write this, I, I, we need about a week and a half, Reports should then be on Menelik's desk in detail, telling you what we're trying to explain to see how helpful as you can kick that around. Uh, the notion that we produce in that workshop will be to the rest of the work we've got to do. I enjoyed being with y'all this weekend. It was fantastic. I love you. I said before, you know, Wade Noble said, people said we romanticize Africa. I romanticize the heck out of Africa. Because Wade said that if you love something, you should have a romance with it. There's nothing wrong with romancing Africa. Just don't stop at the romance. Thank you. And just let me add that this great African man there, Professor James Small, one of the greatest leaders that we have right now. Brother has been there in the dirt serving African people. Give him some more love, please. Thank you. And now, Baba Leonard Jeffries. He's on the move. Please, everyone. He's 69 and doing fine. Stand up and welcome this great African warrior. That's right. This great African warrior, 69, and doing fine. Baba. Leonard Jeffries. Baba, Leonard Jeffries. Baba, Leonard Jeffries. 69, and taking his time. <laughs> That's right, Baba Leonard Jeffries. Give him some more love, he's coming. He's an elder, he can do whatever he wants, he said. Come on now, that's it, get up. <laughs> okay, brothers and sisters, 
OTEP family, pleasure to join you once again at a strategic and important moment in the struggle to restore Africanness. I was looking in the back for Brother Monty, he's supposed to take us to the airport. Do you think it's better to take Brother Small and come back and get me? No, my flight is, is eight, but I, don't, I have to get there. You got to get there at least an hour ahead. Okay, we'll work it out. Uh, Brother Monty, take, take uh, Brother Small and then come on back. And if you're not back in time, meet me at the airport because other folks will be taking me to the airport. And anyway, brothers and sisters, <laughs> it, it was good to break the flow of Professor James Small. Wasn't he smoking? He was possessed. And that's just a little tidbit. This brother has spent day and night for the last 40 years or more thinking on how we should be moving spiritually to transform ourselves into powerful African spirits. And so, you just got a little taste of what he usually does every day, you know. The only person he doesn't mess with too bad is myself because I'm just older than him and we need each other. But I know what he wants to say to me so he don't have to worry. I got the message just by body language and just his spirit. Well, I certainly am glad to uh, join our family here at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Let's give the Shrine and the leadership and the knowledge. I have had a romance and love with and of the Shrine for more than 50 years. It was in Detroit that I made my contact with the Shrine. And I've been to a good many of them, certainly Houston and here. Uh, that's been a part of my experience. And all of it has been uh, positive in terms of rebuilding community. So the family comes together again at an important occasion, and we need to acknowledge this young leadership that has emerged around Minister uh, Menelik. Let's give him and his leadership an acknowledgement. And yes, I'm 69 and doing fine. But I could drop dead this evening. So you need to know that there are young people who are coming up under you that are going to carry on this enormous struggle that we have waged, this historic struggle to restore African peoples uh, to their greatness. And so whenever I see young people, and I see them everywhere, uh, doing like we've done this weekend, I'm lifted up. And I told our group as we left each other this morning, going over the refinement of the issues that they're replicated everywhere I go. And I travel all around the African world. And so what we're doing here in Atlanta and the people who come from other places to join the family in Atlanta is being replicated in, in South America, in Central America, uh, among the Garifuna or the Garifuna people. There's a new African consciousness, a new restoration. Uh, even the new presidents of Latin America these more progressive uh, presidents, even the socialist presidents of Latin America are talking about acknowledgement and, and restoration of the African dignity among their cultures. I go to Brazil often, and uh, Brazil has this vibrant uh, African culture that's looking more to its Pan-African uh, roots. Uh, whether you go to Bahia, Salvador, the capital, and you relate to Oladun, Oladun is the great uh, musical group and cultural group that moves through the streets of, of Bahia uh, with a uh, um, hundred or two hundred drummers that just shape your, your very being. Or another more uh, politically conscious and economically conscious group, Ilaie, on another side of, of Bahia. And they've just gotten a seven-story uh, headquarters 
so they can do a great deal of work. So the, what we're doing in the Pan-African movement here is being replicated uh, everywhere else. You go to Toronto, you go to other parts of Canada, and African peoples are coming together, the young people are coming together. You, you saw what was happening in France uh, over this a few months past. But I've been through France, I wasn't surprised, because I've been to those industrial suburbs of France. In America, the white folks with wealth live outside the city. In Europe, they live inside the city, and the poor live outside the city. So you can go to the industrial suburbs of Paris, and you can go for miles and miles and miles and miles and see nothing but tens of thousands of African peoples. And so that's what is being organized uh, in Paris. Uh, it's amazing to see this type of phenomenon, not only in Paris, but in, in a place like Poland, which we think of represents tulips and windmills and wood shoes. But there are hundreds of thousands of African peoples uh, in Holland and Amsterdam and other large cities that have come from South America, Suriname, their great slave colony during the Dutch exploitation of slavery, and the other islands of the Caribbean that have a Dutch relationship. So we need to be able to see ourselves as a global people. And certainly that consciousness that we're talking about is manifest in England. Every time I look up, the people from England are asking me to come over to England. And I'm thinking it's the same group that asked me uh, a couple of months ago. This is another group that comes. This is the Pan-African something, something, something. And the other was the Pan-African something, something, something else. But they all want you to come. And I went over to help a fellow conduct a marriage to this beautiful sister. And he's a leader of a Pan-African group. And I, I couldn't understand why he insisted on my being there for the marriage. And, but, you know, I'm flexible enough to fly there, and I did, and I participated. And they were there when I was there in Birmingham for the uh, uh, 25th of May day. So since they came to support me and Dale Jones and my wife and others that were there, I said, well, I'll, in September, I'll go for the marriage. And there were hundreds of people, all day marriage ceremony, the most beautiful, wonderful thing I can imagine. They even made clothes for me as if I don't have enough African clothes. They made crowns, their ankh and symbols were all over this. And then I still...